<clears throat> so recorder is started up. I was reading an article over the weekend. I think it's from Forbes magazine. And uh, the author was trying to figure out you know, why the new AI product is called QSTAR. And that was an interesting read. And you might ask, so what does that have anything to do with this class? As it turns out, you know, the Q star, you know, mechanism might have something to do with the A star algorithm that you are, that your homework assignment that's due today is about. And then there's also a, a learning method called the Q learning method. So you can look it up to Q learning algorithm. And there you have it. There's a Q learning um, method. So the whole star thing is about, you know, um, using a heuristic. And you can also see, you know, how you are, how we refer to states. So an, a state is basically a vertex from our perspective. An action is kind of like an arc. It's kind of like, a, like an edge from our perspective, not quite exactly the same. So at any state, you have a set of actions. Um, executing an action is you know, a specific state provides an agent with a reward which is a numerical score. You can look at that as kind of the distance, okay? So every edge you know, carries a certain number associated with it. The goal of the agent is to maximize his total reward. So you're basically, instead of minimizing the, the distance of the path, you're trying to maximize. But the concept is still the same. We are optimizing. It does this by adding the maximum reward attainable from future states to the reward for achieving its current state, effectively influencing the current action by the potential future reward, blah, 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 blah. But it is a related problem, okay? If you think about it, this is a related problem. And this also relates to Markov you know, decision process, um, which is basically, it's, there's a certain probability issue involved in all the actions. So when you take a certain action, there is a certain probability distribution of what state you can end up with, and that's kind of the Markov you know, decision process. All of this stuff here, is related to the A star algorithm, which is basically a algorithm in what we call an entire classification of state space search. And all of this stuff here is very interesting to me. I know to you guys it's like, I have no idea why you know, tech is so you know, just about all this. So I'm gonna show you, okay? You, know, you don't have to understand this, but it is something, it's a full cycle, full circle for me. Uh, so if you look at my name and look up, um, admissible heuristic search, okay? Um, it's actually admissible heuristic search and there's also a one word that I'm missing, uh, stochastic, stochastic. The more obscure word you have, you know, in your dissertation, the easier it is to find it. Um, and it is, okay, let me just add one more thing, dissertation. All right, so that should find it somewhere. Nope, darn it. I guess I'm not nearly as famous as I thought I was. <laughs> um, admissible, admissible, okay, does that help? Nope. All right, fine. If you look up my name in the Los, Rio, Los Rios district, you will find a link to it. Okay, there we go. Los Rios tag. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's see if that works. All right, because I updated my, um, what do you call this, biography, and there's a link to it. So I think I put the link somewhere here. Yep, there we go. All right. Here we go. It was just recently that they um, digitized my dissertation, which was basically all printed. Um, and in this one, you know, I have a lot of different algorithms, and they are all sort of related to the A star algorithm. The A star is basically the baseline algorithm, and then all of these are kind of alternatives. And then the the one thing that my dissertation adds to the basic A star algorithm is once you choose your action, you end up with probabilities of ending at multiple you know, different states. It's all probabilistic. So that means you, know, you make a decision, you're at a certain vertex, you make a decision, 
but the decision that you make, the action that you're going to take, will lead you with certain probabilities to potential destination states or destination vertices in our term. So the question is, if things are, trend, you know, are probabilistic in that case, then what can we say about, quote unquote, the shortest path? Because you know, even if you try to go to the, you know, a certain destination state, you know, based on what you know already, you can still end up in a loop, just probabilistically speaking. So how do you describe the shortest path in this case? So the whole dissertation is about that and also the various algorithms that I had to explore to get this done. So this is like a full circle for me because you know this is something that I did in uh, 1995. Okay, that's before the majority of you were born. Okay, um, and yet you know now we are kind of getting back to that. Okay, so I just find it kind of interesting um, that AI is going back and forth. Okay, between neural network type of you know, reinforced learning and you know basically algorithmic type of learning which is basically what Q learning is about. So the whole thing about Q star, guess what that star is going to imply? I'm guessing heuristics. Yep. <laughs> yep. Huh? Pointing to something? Because as instead of a prefix, it's a suffix. So instead of star A, it is A star. Yep. I am recording. Yep, I'm recording right now. So this is something that you might want to kind of look into when you have time, like after the final exams, um, because I think you know this is um, it's probably a new approach of doing things, and you know there are a lot of articles on the speculation of what Q star is representing. So kind of interesting stuff, at least to me. And then one other thing is the final exam schedule, because I have had people asking me, so when are we going to have our final exam? So you just have to ask uh, Google in this case, American River College final exam schedule. And at some point I'm gonna ask Open, well, OpenAI cannot really answer this question because it cannot, it doesn't have live you know, data from the internet. So until it does, it's impossible to give us the answer. So our class is a daytime class. I think it still qual qualifies as daytime because this is a Monday, Wednesday class and then the uh, start time of the class is between 2.45 and 4.45 p.m. So our final exam date is going to be on the Wednesday, December 13th, and the time is from 3 to 5 p.m. It's a two-hour thing, so make sure that you put it on your calendar. Make sure that you don't forget that we are going to have final exam on the 13th, which is the second to the last day of the final week. It's going to be two hours. Now, just because I give you two hours doesn't mean that you have to use two hours. If you get everything done within the first 15 minutes, I mean, you can just kind of go like, I'm done, man. <laughs> can, we use, can we use open AI? Can, can we go to chat GPT? I think, uh, yeah. Open book, open notes, you know, same same kind of format. Yeah. So I will give you the exam from spring 2023, like last semester, um, probably sometime next Monday or Wednesday latest. Uh, so this way you have an idea of you know what I asked or how I asked the question last semester. Yes. Um. Well. I will ask, I can give you a, a variety of format. So, you know, it can range everything from, okay, this is the graph, you know, give me the trace, or I can give you a trace, reconstruct the graph, you know, or this is the trace, and, you know, there are some, some missing values here. Um, based on, you know, what is already in the trace, can you fill in the missing values? So it can be a variety of your know, format. Yes? Say that one more time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. That's what I plan to do. Um, go ahead, Jacob, and then Chris.
That is correct. So as far as classes are concerned, we have today, this Wednesday, next Monday, and then next Wednesday. That's it. So to, including today's class, we only got four, four more sessions. Go ahead, Chris. Hmm? It, yes. So all the homework assignments, everything other than exam one, exam two, and the final exam, they all fall into the homework category. No, it's the final score, which means it is the it's the total score of the entire semester, but not you know as a part of the final exam. Yep. Second exam. Um, I don't have the paper with me, but for those of you who cannot wait to get your you know exam back, I can send you the PDF because like this time I actually scanned everything and I did all the markup you know, on the paper on the not paper but on the PDFs. Yep. Yes, we can do that. All right. So I think we are all set up today. Any other issues that we should address before going to the solution of the A star algorithm? Nope, nothing. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we are looking at the A star. Oh, okay, that won't find it. Keep going, keep going. And there we go. So the application of the A star algorithm. This is your homework assignment. And the way I did this, you know, Okay, so let me first go to Google Sheets on the new tab. I'll make a new version of this. So go to file, make a copy, and I will put it into the share folder. Um, I'll use today's date. So this way it's easier for you guys to look for it. All right. And then the only other thing I have to remember to get is the D you know, and also the H function. So let me go ahead and do a screenshot. This is a pretty nifty tool. And then open it with FDH. Make this always on top. And I am recording. Everything is good. The voice is good. The audio part is good too. All right. So I'm going to put this all the way up here. <clears throat> and then go to the copy, which is today's date. Okay, so this is how we're going to get started. I have already remembered the algorithm, so I don't have to look up the algorithm. So for those of you, you know, who are kind of like, you know, still trying to get used to the algorithm, um, if you have a mobile device or if you have printed out the notes, it would be a good idea to kind of look at your, look at the algorithm at the same time. So this way you can kind of correspond, you know, what I'm doing on the screen with the algorithm itself. I can sort of go back and forth a little bit, but I think that's going to be more confusing than it is going to help. Um, but that's an option. So I just look up to the graph you know, module and go to the algorithm, the A star algorithm. And I'm not sure how many of you have tried to read all this stuff on the phone. It actually works fairly well. Um, because, you know, all the web pages that I create here are very vanilla, you know, which means that they're very plain. So on a mobile device like a cell phone, it actually works, you know, surprisingly well. <clears throat> all right, so this is the algorithm, but I'm not going to back, go back and forth too much. Instead, I'll just focus on what needs to be done, and I'll just describe it. But if you have the algorithm in front of you, okay, it might be helpful to kind of cross-reference between those two. The first thing is we have to initialize, okay? We have to initialize the G value, the F value, as well as the previous. And um, I set up the spreadsheet so that row three is always going to reflect the last update, which makes it easier to track you know, what you're doing because if the, if the trace is getting longer and longer, then you can easily lose track of what is the current G value again? So that's what the uh, the third row is about. Some people delete you know, all those you know, kind of magic stuff that I do, but that's okay. 
either way, you know, as long as I can see that you can follow the algorithm correctly, it will still be fine. All right. So um, in the A star algorithm, the starting point, okay, the, ori the, or the origin is the one that is special. So the origin is going to have, you know, everyone is going to have undefined uh, starting points. I can use a question mark. I can use uh, U undefined or UND, you know, to mark everything. And then for the G values, um, it, it's either infinity or zero, okay? Because the G value of a vertex is the length of the shortest path from the start to that particular vertex. So that means if vertex A is the start vertex, then the G value has to be a zero because you know, it is already there. We are already at vertex A. And then for everything else, it's infinite. So you can always just you know, type your INF if you don't want to use the Unicode for the infinity symbol. F is a little bit different. F is the, the F value of something is the G value of the same thing, but plus the heuristic value from that vertex to the destination. In this case, the destination is vertex X. So we can see the heuristic of AX is a zero. So that means the F value of A is zero plus zero, which is still a zero. Everything else, there's still infinity because you're basically adding the H value to infinity, which still ends up as an infinity. Um, and then we also initialize the set O, in this case, to really just the start vertex, which is vertex A in this case. So this is how we get everything started. Do we have any questions about the initialization of uh, big O, prev, G, or F? The questions, right? Is this font okay? Is it too big, too small to the rest, you know, especially people in the back of the classroom? Is it legible? Okay, cool. Because I can make it bigger if you guys want it to be slightly bigger. And I'm gonna maximize the use of the screen you know, just so that you know we just it's just easier to read like this. All right. So according to the algorithm, um, we determine whether we can get out of the algorithm by comparing. <clears throat> the F value of the vertices in O versus the G value of the destination. The G value of the destination is currently an infinity, and of the only one vertex in the set O, it has an F value of zero. So we have to ask, is zero less than infinity? Yes. So that means you know, we, are not, we are not done yet, okay? So we, now, now when we get into the while loop, the first thing we do is we choose a vertex inside the set O where it has the lowest um, F value. Well, since we only got one vertex in the set O, it's got to be it, okay? So we take A out, and then the um, set O becomes you know, empty because you know, we have to remember, hey, we just got A out of the set, so we have to you know, um, remove vertex A from the set O. And then we have to look at all the outgoing neighbors. Now, I call these outgoing neighbors because we have edges from vertex A to those particular vertices. So they are called outgoing neighbors in this case. And there are three of those, okay? X is one, B is one, and C is one as well. So for each one, we have to compute the, t, the value of T, which is basically just a local variable, which essentially is the G value of A plus the distance of the edge leading to that particular vertex. I don't have any preference between you know, how to explore uh, vertex X, vertex B, or vertex C. So you guys can choose you know, how we want to proceed at this point. Which one do you want to go first, explore first? Pick one. C, okay, so we'll pick C. All right, so that means the value of T is going to be G of A, which is a zero, plus the distance from A to C. The distance from A to C is a five. Zero plus five is a five. So now you have to ask, did I just find a shorter path to vertex C compared to the currently known shortest path? How do we know that? We look at G of C. G of C is an infinity right now, which means we have not found any path from the start vertex to vertex C. So this is definitely a shorter path. Is that okay? Because T is representing the length of the new path, which is an alternative, from the start vertex to vertex C. And we are asking, 
um, did we find a shorter path to vertex C? The answer is yes, we found a shorter path to vertex C because we're comparing this five, whoops, to the infinity value that it has right now, the G value. Is that okay? So I'm describing the algorithm. So um, you know, if you are going like, yes, we know that already. That's a good sign because it means that you actually study the algorithm and understand what it means. On the other hand, for people who are thinking, I have no idea what you're talking about. As I usually say in my classes these days, I would start to worry. <laughs> yep. All right. So now we go like, yep, we have to update. So we got a few things to update. The first thing we're going to update is g of c, okay, like that. And then the next thing we have to update is f of c. f of c is always g of c plus the heuristic to go from c to x, which is our destination. And we just have to look up here. Uh, the heuristic to go from c to x is a zero. So five plus zero is still a five. So we put a five here as well. We also have to update the previous. So we're basically saying in order to get to c as quickly as possible or with the least distance, the currently known alternative is to start with A, okay? So come from A to get to C, so the previous of C becomes A. And then at the same time, we also have to add <clears throat> C to the set because you know, we are now saying, oh, we just updated the G value of C, so that might, you know, for, you know that might be used as a hint for other vertices you know, to connect from the start vertex to some other vertices downstream and find the shorter path to those other vertices. So that's why we're adding vertex C to O and that finishes the update for um, N, B, and C. Are we okay here or not? Okay, so now uh, which other one do you want to choose? We can choose between X versus B, pick one. B, okay, so we can choose B. All right, so with B, uh, once again, we have to compute T first, which is G of A, which is still a zero, plus the distance from A to B. The distance from A to B is a three, zero plus three is a three. So now we update this to a three, and then we have to compare this with G of B, because G of B is representing the length of the shortest path from the start vertex to vertex B up to this point, and T is representing the length of an alternate path to vertex B from the starting point, which is A. And we can see that, huh, okay, looks like we found a shorter path. So let's update it. So we are going into the then portion of the conditional statement, which updates you know, G of B to a three, which is T. And then we also have to update um, F of B. F of B is G of B plus the heuristic from B to X, which is a four. 3 plus 4 is a 7. We update the previous. The quickest, the quickest way to get to B is from A. So we update this to A also. And now that we have updated the G value of B, we also have to add B to the set O. And now O has C and B in it. So now we don't have a choice because of the three outgoing neighbors from vertex A, X is the only one that we have not explored yet. So we explore x. Uh, once again, we compute the t value, which is g of a plus the edge leading from a to x. That has a distance of 10. So now you know, t is 10. Did we just find a shorter path to the destination? Yep, because we did not know any path at all. Now we have a path. So now we update you know, g of x to be 10. And then from uh, the heuristic from the destination to itself is always 0 because this cannot be an overestimate. So it always has to be zero in that case. And in order to get to the destination, we also want to start from vertex A. So the previous of X is going to update to an A. And because we just updated the G value of X, we also have to add X to the set of O. In other words, other than the initialization and other than how we um, handle the H value, the destination is not treated in any special way. It is just a vertex in the algorithm. All right, so now we have gone through the first iteration through the while loop. Do we have any questions? No questions? Yep, go ahead. Okay, which uh, column eight? 
You mean column seven? Okay, general question. Okay, go ahead. Are you asking why we update all the previous two A's over here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Take your time. But you may not end up updating anything. So in other words, I think if I understand you correctly, you are saying that you know, since you know, this is A, you automatically put A into these spots. But the answer is you cannot always do that because we only get to modify the previous of you know these vertices, B, C, and X, only because the condition of the conditional statement turns out to be true. In other words, okay, let, let me switch to the algorithm. This is where you're know, being able to display the algorithm on the side can be helpful. And I think I got enough space on the screen to do that. Let me just kind of do this. Uh, move tab to new window, and then turn this one to uh, unmaximize, and then resize this one. Um, yep, okay, that might fit. Yes, okay, that fit. All right, so the, so the concept is, has to do with the conditional statement in the while loop. All right, so generally speaking, this is the entire loop, right? This is the algorithm. Everything before this is just initialization. So you can see how the update of the previous is down here, which means you know the condition of t being less than g of n has to be true first. So if you are only at this point knowing that variable c is vertex a, you cannot know ahead of time that you have to update the previous of every single one of these possible ends. You, on, you can only evaluate that when n becomes c, then you can evaluate t. And after you evaluate t, only at that point you can perform this comparison. And then only at that point you can evaluate, do I get to the then statement of the conditional statement? There would not be any update. Now, in this homework assignment, it just, it just turns out that we update every single time because I made the heuristic to be as painful as possible. So that means we go back and we update everything. So, but that's only by design that I'd make it this way. But in general, um, the idea is if the heuristic is helpful, we are not going to perform these updates as many times as we do here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can sort of do that, you know, but I still want to see the unknown, you know, I'm not going to take a whole lot of points off, if any, um, if you do not say that, but because the initialization process did specify the previous of V for every single vertex V, is supposed to be undefined, so we want to kind of denote your know, undefined in the trace too, because uninitialized does not mean it is undefined. Undefined is a very definite thing to say that, yep, this is a very specific value that is called undefined. Yep, but that's okay if you leave it blank. You know, I can understand that it's just your know, uninitialized. So there's a difference between a variable that is uninitialized versus a variable that is, that's initialized with an undefined value. Now, I know this is like totally nonsense to most of you because you programmed in, what, C++ and Java for the most part. And in both of those languages, they do not have a value called undefined. Guess which programming language has a very specific value called undefined? No? 
No. Well, maybe. Python, I'm not sure. JavaScript. <laughs> so in JavaScript, they have a very specific value called undefined and a different value called null. And they have different meanings. So when you try to refer to a member of, a, of an object that does not exist, it will give you undefined. So, um, and that's why we have triple equal, you know, in uh, scripting languages like you know, JavaScript, because it basically says, do not attempt type coercion when you perform this comparison. You guys remember what is type coercion? This is from CISP 360. What is type coercion? Sounds like a bad thing. Coercion can never be a good thing. Yep, go ahead. Yep, it's automatic typecasting. So in the case of equal equal, there's an automatic typecasting, which means if one side is a true false, then they will try to, the other side want to cast it to a Boolean. If one side is a zero, which is a numerical value, the other side will try to cast it to a numerical value. So equal equal says do typecasting whenever it's possible. And in a scripting language, type coercion can do weird stuff. Like the empty string can also be, they, it can also mean false, okay? Which is kind of like sort of, but not exactly, right? Undefined can also be interpreted as false. No can also be interpreted as false, but they are really kind of different things. So triple equal in a, in a scripting language like uh, JavaScript means do not attempt any type coercion. If the types do not match, then it is automatically a not equal to. So when you try to match false on one side and undefined on the other side, it will come back as a fail, okay? It is not a match. But if you use a double equal, it will say, yep, they, are, they can be seen as the same thing. Same thing with a zero versus, versus a false, empty string versus a false, double equal says yes, triple equal says no. So in JavaScript, there are no such thing as undefined integers, <laughs> un, uh, un, unsigned integers. Yeah, so it only has numbers, which are basically your double in C++. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, JavaScript is weird in many ways, you know, but it does, it, it does certain things a lot better compared to C, C++ and Java, and, but it is kind of weird you know, if you're coming from C++ and Java. You have to kind of, that it would not, yeah. It depends on, if you spell out 11 <laughs> and you said minus you know, the string of one, you know, that may not work. Yep. When do you uh, undefine the string? So it depends on the API. So it depends on what the function is trying to say, right? So certain functions will say, if this thing does not exist, you're trying to find something in an array and it doesn't exist, then the function would return a null value. So that's when you know that, okay, I can expect either a null value or the index into the array where I can find that particular element. So undefined, on the other hand, has also a very specific use. So you just have to read the documents very carefully and find out you know, when it is going to give you a value of null, when it is going to give you a value of undefined, when it's going to give you a value of zero, and when it will give you a value of an empty string, and when it's going to give you a value of Boolean false. But the, all of the above can be considered the same thing when you have double equal, which is also explaining why Canvas has a bug of if you have a numerical question and you answer zero, it will give you a false positive warning of, hey, you did not answer this question because it is comparing that zero to empty string to false and it's using a double equal. So it will give you a false positive when your answer is really just zero, but it was basically interpreted as false, which is also empty string. Yep. Yes, yes. And years ago, I gave them that idea already. I said, you know, I already know where your bug is from the symptom and they have not made that change at all. <laughs> I have no idea. I do not work for Instructure, which is uh, the company behind Canvas. If I had to guess, it is because it's a for-profit company 
and fixing this bug does not seem to make any money. I mean, the number of people using that feature in Canvas to have computed you know, answers you know, in the quiz is probably in single digit in any college. So instead of spending the time to fix that bug by adding one more equal sign, they want to do something else. Hmm? I, I have been using Moodle for a long time, and then by, by the district switching to Canvas, I had to stop using Moodle, which is a completely open source platform. But it's a, an agreement. It's a long story. I have my own conspiracy theory about it, but it does not belong to this class. <laughs> we, can, we can talk after class. All right, so this is the best part about a trace like this is I can leave it up at any time and then come pick you up later, right? Because we have the full state of everything. So at this point, we are done with the for each loop inside the while loop. We go back to the beginning of the while loop and then we look at the set O and we ask, are we done? Well, we know we are not done, but how do we know we are not done? The algorithm, which is here, specifies, okay, where is it? Uh, Oh, right here. Okay, I forgot to put it out. So if you look at the while loop, okay, this statement here, it says, can we find at least one vertex in O such that the F value of that vertex is less than the G value of the destination? That's what it's asking. So if I go back to the trace, okay, which is here, what do you think? We have three vertices in O is the F value of C, B, or X less than the G value of X. Well, let's look at the G value of X first. It is a 10. Now we look at the F value of C. It is a 5. Okay, so that meets the requirement already. So that tells me that we cannot terminate the loop just yet. So once we get into the loop, we have to find the vertex where it has at least one of the least F values because they can be equal, but in this case, they are not equal because we are evaluating the F value of C, which is a five, versus the F value of B, which is a seven. So C has a smaller value, so we have to choose vertex C. So this looks a little bit confusing because this vertex C, this is referring to the vertex called C. This, on the other hand, is referring to the variable C. So that's why they are a little bit different. So now we look at the outgoing neighbor of vertex C, which means, you know, okay, where does C go to? C goes to only one place, which is our destination. So that means you know, um, our only option here is X. So now we have to compute T again. So T is computed right here. So we have to look at G of C in this case. G of C is a five. And then we have to add the distance of the edge in CX, which is a three. 5 plus 3 is an 8, okay? So that means your variable t is going to have a value of 8. And then we have to compare the 8 with the current uh, g value of the destination, g of x. g of x currently has a value of 10, so we have to update because we just found a shorter path to the destination or to vertex x. So now we update a bunch of stuff. This is updated to 8. This is also updated to 8 because the heuristic value of the destination to itself has to be a zero. And then we update the um, previous so that in order to get to the destination, we don't want to come from vertex A anymore. We want to come from vertex B. Oh, vertex C, sorry. So we want to come from vertex C, and then we have to add vertex C back into the set O. So C, B, X, because it's already here, but you know we have to we have to add vertex x back into the set, but it's already here, so it is as if I didn't change anything. All right, so I'm going to pause here. Do we have any questions about this part? Yep. Yeah. Huh? Oh, I forgot to take c out. Yep, you're correct. So after we take c out, we only got b and x left. That is correct. Thank you. All right. Question? Hmm? Oh, in down below. Yep. Okay. Fix that too. There we go. Thank you. All right. So what do we do next? Well, we are done with the for each loop, so we have to go all the way back to the while loop. We only got two vertices left, and the question is, 
is at least one of these vertices having an F value that is less than the G value of the destination X. The destination X now has a G value of eight. The F value of B is a seven. So we are still meeting this requirement here. So that means we have to continue with another iteration of the while loop, which means the first thing we have to do is to pick out a vertex out of the set O where it has the least F value. So you look at the F value of B, it is a seven. You look at the F value of X, it is an eight. So B it is. So we choose B and this time I forget to update here O. And now we have to look at the outgoing neighbors of B. So when you look up the edges, the only outgoing of outgoing edge of B is to go to vertex C. So that means you know, we have to uh, put C over here. And now we have to compute the value of T, which is the G value of B. The G value of B is a three plus the distance of the edge BC. So we are looking at what? Three plus one, which is a four. So we have a four here. And then we ask, is this four, which is an alternate, the length of an alternate path to vertex C, is it less than the length of the shortest known path to vertex C, which is reflected by G of C, which is a five. So you can now see why your row three can be very handy because it just shows me the latest value. So now we go like, yep, four is less than five. Let's go do some updates. So we put a four here. And then over here, we have to add four, add to four the heuristic value from C to X. So the heuristic value from C to X is a zero. Four plus zero is still a four. And then we update uh, to get to B. In order to get to C, we want to come from B. And then we want to add C back to the set. So X is no longer alone in the set because we're adding C back to the set. Is that okay? So this is something that did not happen when we were um, experimenting with Dijkstra's algorithm. I don't recall a single time that we add a vertex back into the set Q in that case. But in this case, we can potentially re-add a vertex back into the set O. Um, C is the only outgoing neighbor of B, so we are now done with the for each loop. In other words, this loop here is now done. Now we go back to the while loop and then we ask basically the same question. Is at least one vertex in the set O having a F value that is less than the G value of the destination? So we are comparing um, the, the F value of C versus the G value of the destination, which is eight. So we go like, yep, we have at least one. Okay, that's good enough. Now we have to choose which vertex in the set O has the smallest F value. That's between C and X. C has an F value of four, X has an F value of eight, so C it is. So now we choose C again as you know, variable C, and we go look at the outgoing edge of C again, which is X, and then we ask, okay, this time, what is T? Same way to compute, even though the outcome is different, we look at G of C, G of C is a four, and we add to the four um, the distance of the edge of CX. So CX has a distance of three. So we are basically looking at four plus three, which is a seven. And then we compare this seven to the G value of the destination or G of X. G of X is eight at this point. Seven is less than eight. So, oh, okay, one, one did the wrong thing, even though they are the same value, but G of X is eight. So we just found another shorter path to vertex X. So now we have to go through the updates. Seven here, seven here. And then to get to vertex X, we want to come from vertex C. So even though it technically, it is not exactly in an update, we still have to kind of put a C over here. Um, and then back to here, we have to add vertex X to the set. I forgot to take C out again. <clears throat> so this is still X because we are adding X back to the set O, which already has X to begin with. So at this point, we are done with the for each loop. We go back to the while loop. So now we ask the same question. Can we find at least one index, one vertex in set O where the F value is less than the G value of the destination X. The G value of destination X is a seven. 
the only vertex in set O is also just x, which currently has an f value of 7. 7 is not less than 7, so we are done. So we basically exit the while loop with one element remaining in the set O. Now that is only because of the way of we set up this particular example. It is entirely possible that you can exit when O still has a bunch of vertices. If the heuristics work out the way they're supposed to work out, you should end up with a lot of vertices in O, which basically you're, you're saying, okay, the heuristic is so useful to guide me to find the shortest path to begin with. There are many other ways to get to the destination, but the heuristic is already telling me that none of those will give us a shorter path. And therefore we can exit even with when those paths are not fully explored. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You would terminate early, too early. You, you would terminate too early because you are basically inflating the F value, which means you, know, you would prematurely tell yourself that you know, we do not have a better option anymore. Um, in fact, you can try that, right? I mean, you can try the, the um, so when the heuristic value is not overestimating, it is called an admissible heuristic. So you can try out heuristic values that are overestimating. You'll just kind of, you'll just mess around with these values here. Go through the algorithm again, okay, and see you know, whether it makes a difference or not. All right. So do we have any questions about this particular trace? Yep, go ahead. Ah. Yeah, so the way we do that is uh, we track down from the destination so we look at the pre, we, we start with the destination. The previous of the destination is C, so we then go to vertex C. The previous of C is a B, and then the previous of B is A. So that's how we retrace the shortest path, is to start with the destination vertex and only use the previous to track our way back to the start vertex. So that's how you can find the actual shortest path. All right. Any other questions about A star, the A star algorithm? No questions? All right. If there are no questions, then we are going to proceed to talk more about graphs. And this time we are combining that with predicate calculus, okay? So how do we find the length of the shortest path from a certain vertex to another vertex? That's what we are asking, okay? So let me put this back into this tab here. <clears throat> and I'll close this window here because it's not needed anymore. And then we get to swoosh. And let me look up which window we have. Okay, this is the right one. I thought about turning this into a homework assignment and then I thought, Maybe not, because you know, we have only talked about your know, prologue for one single class, and we haven't really, really talked about the syntax or how to use uh, a declarative programming style. So I just decided against that idea of giving you this homework assignment, you know, of you know, come up, coming up with the program to find the length of the shortest path. So instead of doing that, I'm explaining a program that's already done. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a look at this one and then try to figure out what it is trying to do. So the first thing is I'm defining some edges. This is a combination of defining the edges and also defining the distance of the edges because you know, I, just found, I just found that it's not productive to define the edges and then define the distance of the edges because you, it's basically the same thing. So might as well just combine the, the definition of the edges along with the distance of the edges. So what the first, the second line is trying to say is to go from V0 to V5 as two vertices, uh, there's an edge and the distance of the edge is three. 
So that's basically how we read uh, from line two to line nine is you know they're defining the edges as well as the distances of the edges. So do we have any questions about how what line two to nine are trying to do? Okay. So if you're curious, you can already kind of experiment with um, prologue and say, okay, where can I go from V0? So you specify V0 with a lowercase, which means this is now specifying a particular item in the universe. But then you can say uh, the other vertex is just uppercase V. We don't care. I don't care what it is. And the distance is also something that I do not care. And then just ask, it, ask this question. So what you're really asking in this case is show me all the outgoing edges from vertex V0. Is that okay? So now we press Control Enter. It shows us, you know, that's one answer. You know, D is three, V is in V5, which is the first one. Next is V, D is three, um, and then the destination, I mean, the other vertex is V1, and then it will give us false. Oh, there's another one. Yep, I forgot about this one. <laughs> so we can also have an edge that has a distance of two from V0 to V3, and then there's one more, which is you know from V0 to V2, it has a distance of one, and that should be it. So that's why you know there's there's no more button for me to click on next. So just looking at the edges, we can kind of see how Prolog is an interesting engine where it will go for one solution, but it doesn't just give you a solution. It will give you all the solution. It is a universal quantifier. It goes through all the possible answers. Is that okay? So that makes it a very interesting programming language because even Lisp does not do that natively. Lisp is a symbolic processing language, which was a competitor um, of Prolog back in the AI war in the 80s. But Prolog has this uh, kind of unique feature of, I'm not just gonna, gonna find you a solution, I'll find you all the solutions. Everything that fits this particular template, which is over here, I'll give you all of those, okay? All right, so the first thing I define is a predicate that is called a boundary. So let's take a look, closer look at boundary. So boundary is not really exactly a good name. Let me explain what the parameters are. So you can see this as an X. This is also an X, which means in this case, in order for this predicate to make sense, to be true, we are looking at the first and the second slot to be exactly the same vertex. So to go from a vertex to itself, okay? So how can we make this true? We have n, which is the length of the path, and then we also have h, which is the number of hops left. Or you can look at it as the number of edges left that I can use. So you are allowed a certain allowance of your know, edges. Like you can, you can start with four edges. You can start with three edges, okay? But you, we cannot explore um, paths that extend beyond the total number of edges. So in order for this predicate to be true, I need h to be greater than or equal to zero, which means this does not use up an edge, okay? So I can have zero edges left in my allowance, but as long as I'm looking for a way to get from a vertex to itself, it's good, okay? As long as h is greater than or equal to zero, I have met that requirement. And then n is the answer, so in this case, in order for a vertex to go to itself, I don't need to go anywhere. So the length of the shortest path from a vertex to itself is always going to be a zero. Is that okay? All right. So now we can, um, what if this predicate is not true? In other words, what if I'm trying to find the length of a shortest path from a vertex to a different vertex, and I'm given a certain allowance of hops but that's not that, that's going to fail line 12 because line 12 requires that you are starting from a vertex and you want to end up at the same vertex and that's why we see two x's here because they really are referring to the same vertex so if this fails then we fall we fall through to the second boundary so the second boundary as a predicate has slightly different parameters so this time we are starting with vertex x we want to end up at vertex y now, can X and Y be the same? The answer is not exactly. Because if X and Y were the same, it would have been caught by the first case already. So by the time we get to the second predicate, we are pretty sure that X and Y are not the same. 
That is not entirely true because you can also basically fail the first predicate because your know, h is less than zero, or you know n is a given value and it is not zero. So there are other ways to fail the first predicate, but none of those are as intended as the way that we want to use boundary. So by the time we get to the second boundary on line 13, x and y are referring to different vertices. So the question is, can I go from this vertex to this vertex, given that I have an allowance of this many edges, and compute the length of that path for me? So that's what these four parameters are trying to specify. Are we still doing okay so far with the understanding of this code? So, sort of, okay. So when we ask questions later on, you know, when we play with this, we'll see how it works. So the first thing that is required in order for this predicate to be true is I need to make sure that I have at least one edge left in my allowance because X and Y are different. So I need at least one edge to go from X to Y. Does that make sense? Okay. And then the next thing we need to do is to go like, okay, find me an edge from X to some vertex Z. And, you know, and at the same time, find out what is the distance of that one edge. That's what the second line is trying to say. And once we have found the edge, okay, which, is, which does not seem to be related to the question, because Z really has nothing to do with Y, okay, at least at this point, but we do want to find the edge from X to Z. And then the number of edges that we have left, the allowance, is now one fewer than what we started off here because we just used up one on the edge that we found on line 15. Is that okay? So H1 is representing how many edges do I have left in my allowance in the attempt to find a path from X to Y. We just used up one. And then this is the, the best part is the recursive part, okay? So the recursive part on line 17 is saying, okay, now that we can go from X to Z, we found out how to get there, we used up one hop to do it, can we find a path from Z to Y given that we have H1 as a allowance of the number of edges left and give me the length, if that path exists, give me the length as N2. Let me say that one more time. On line 17, we are really asking the question, can we find a path from Z to Y given that we have H1 number of hops left, okay, that, that's, um, that's my allowance, which is one fewer than you know, the original problem is, because the original problem starts with H hops, now we have H minus one hops here. And by the way, if you find a path, return the length of that path to me as N2. So now we have N1 being the distance of the edge from X to Z, we have N2 being the length of a path from Z to Y, if it does exist. So by the time we get to line 18, it means all the previous conditions have been met already. What does that mean? Well, it means exactly what I just said. H is greater than zero. We found an edge from X to Z with, an, with a distance of N1. H1 is H minus one, okay? That's something that I make happen. And we also found a path from Z to Y using only up to H1 hops and the actual length of that path is N2. So that means, oh, that means that I have just found a path from X to Y. The length of that path is now N1 plus N2 because N1 is the length, is the, is the distance of the edge that we found earlier. N2 is the length of the path from Z to Y, but when, you, when, I, when I add those two together, I get N, which is the value that I want to return as the length of a path that involves up to H edges from X to Y. Whew, okay. Are there any questions? Does it seem to make sense to you? Well, let's try it out, okay? So let's try this out. Um, so the first thing we want to do is to look at this little uh, graph here and find ourselves you know, a difficult case, okay? So um, I'll draw the graph first, you know, just so that it's more visual, okay? And 
I can do this on the side. I think there's enough space to do this. Oh, I haven't really used the tablet today yet. Okay, so I have to discard that too. Um. <clears throat> ADB still server. Nope. I have to reconnect my tablet. There we go. Okay. All right. So we have V0 going to V5 with, with a distance of 3. V5 going to V4 with a distance of 3. V0 also goes to V1 which an edge with, with a distance of 3. V1 also goes to V4 with a distance of 2. V0 goes to V3 with an with a distance of 2. V3 goes to V4 with a distance of 1. And then we got V0 going to V2 with a distance of 1. And then V2 is going back to V0 with a distance of 1. So we do have a loop here, okay, which is kind of interesting because the algorithm itself has no ability to detect loops. So instead of detecting loops and go like, hey, we, we, we saw this already, it is using the hop approach to say, okay, whatever path we are trying to find, do not exceed this many edges along the way. Now, technically speaking, I cannot call these paths anymore because a path cannot have a repeating vertex, but you know, so they're called, cannot remember the technical term of that. Instead of a path, it is called a, it's not a route, Okay, now I have to look it up because the use of precise term is important here. So I have to look up path with repeating vertex in a graph. It's a, called a walk. <laughs> so a walk is um, a tuple of vertices where there are edges between adjacent vertices, but they can repeat. You can basically go through loops in a walk, but a path cannot have a loop. So the technical term to refer to the program that we were looking at is, it is they are not paths, they are walks. All right. So what was I about to do? Test it, right. Okay, so we want to look at the graph first. Okay, so we this is the graph that we have. And let's say we want to get to V2 in one single hop. Okay, so the program should be able to tell us, nah, not going to happen, right? So let's try that. Because when you look at this graph here, this is V0, which is where I want to start. And this is V4. And you can see there are no path here that can be accomplished by, by one single edge. So now we go back to the algorithm. And then we ask, <clears throat> boundary, I want to go from V0 to V4. Tell me what N is, which is the length of that path or that walk, okay? And I want to only do it, I want to accomplish this at the most using one single edge. Control Enter, comes back and say, nope, not gonna happen. I cannot find any way to go from V0 to V4 with only one single edge in that walk, okay? And we go like, okay, fine, let's see if we can do it in two edges. And there are a few ways, okay? So when you increase that to two, it will give you multiple answers. The first one is a six, a five, a three, and then we are done. Why are there three possible answers? Let's take a look at the graph again. So three plus three is a six. Three plus two is a five. Two plus one is a three. So it gave me all the possible answers. It did not just say, oh, we found one, you walk, and I'm done. Okay, it says, okay, this is one solution. Let me see if there are other solutions. It, it went back to explore the other solutions. Is that okay? So now the question is, what about bumping up that number of hops, not to three, but to four directly? 
you go like that is not that doesn't seem to make sense okay because we found those you know paths already so what type of answer can this give me that we have not seen before remember the four this four here is an upper bound it basically says i have an allowance of up to using up to four edges i don't have to use all four edges okay so that means this is going to give me the same solution as before but there's one more solution it's going to give me i should say there are three more solutions it's going to give me okay so there'll be six solutions this time and you guys would go like oh so that's how it works okay so control enter <clears throat> gave me a six okay gave me a five gave me a three same as all of the other solutions now it's going to give me an eight a seven and a five you go like what because it went for the loops okay so if i were to go back to this picture what it did this time was to say well since i have four edges to spend okay i'm gonna do this start with this go to here back to myself then here then here that uses up exactly four edges in other words it will give you the length of all the walks not paths all the walks that can use up to four edges including going through loops is that okay so this is not a star this is not dijkstra's algorithm this is a unique approach of finding the length of the shortest path using a simple prolog program that does not even bother to use lists which can be used to kind of keep track of the vertices and actually report what is the shortest path. This one doesn't tell you the shortest path. It can only tell you what is the length of the shortest path. Are we good so far? Does everybody kind of understand what boundary is doing? Okay. So given that is the case, it is not telling us the shortest path. So what good is this? Okay. It doesn't even find me, you know, it doesn't even know what is the number of hops that is actually needed. So what we do next is to find, is a fine boundary. In other words, we're trying to find out, you know, how many hops do we need? So it has two predicate definitions. <clears throat> the first one is nothing more than, oh, just ask boundary. And you can see how find boundary has exactly the same four variables as the call to boundary. In other words, if I can find a path from X to Y, given that I have up to H hops and returning a value of N as the length of that path or that walk from X to Y, then I have found the actual solution to the original problem. Okay, that doesn't seem very interesting, right? But what if this fails? In other words, I did not give it enough hops. I did not give it enough out allowance of edges. They go like, fine i'm giving you one more now so the way prolog evaluates the predicate is it will always go from top to bottom if the first one fails it falls onto the second one if the second one fa fails it falls onto the third one and so on is that okay so let me just say that one more time find the boundary as a collection of predicates is basically saying try to find me the minimum number of hops that are needed in order to go from X to Y. That's basically what it's trying to say. So how do we test this? So the way we test this is say find boundary here. And this time I will start with a zero. In other words, try your best with zero allowance. You cannot use a single edge, okay, to go from V0 to V4. You, go, you guys are going like, this is not possible. Well, it's going to find out what is the minimum. What is the min minimum number that we need here? Oh, okay. Control enter, not just enter. Control enter. It finds me that um, there's an answer of six. Now, this will never end, okay, because it'll, it will exhaust everything that would need only two edges and then move on to three edges, four edges. And that's why we see the eight, seven, and the five. Five edges, which will give us exactly the same thing as before. And now we move on to six edges, which means we'll see six, five, three, 
eight, seven, five, and then 10, nine, and a seven, because it go through the, the loop twice this time to use up all the allowances, okay? So this will never end, okay? This will never stop unless I say stop here. You go like, okay, that doesn't seem to be very useful. Um, it doesn't even know which path is the shortest, okay? So I, I make another predicate in this case. It's called path bound. So path bound itself has two predicates. The first predicate is basically, so this time L is representing a limit in terms of the length. It is no longer a limit based on the number of edges. L is an allowance based on the length of the path. It's like, do not exceed this much, okay? So what path bound is really asking is, I can let you, I want to go from X to Y, I allow you to use, um, the upper bound is L, but it's not inclusive, okay? In other words, do not get to L, okay? Anything less than L is fine. If the length of the path is less than L, I consider that a success. But if it's at least L, it's a failure, okay? N is the actual length of the path that I find. So in other words, L is an upper bound of the length of the path that I can find. N is the actual length of the path that I'm finding. So in this case, you know, the way it works is, um, first of all, if X and Y are not the same, then you know, this does not have the ability to find a path from a vertex to itself, because I think who wants to find a path from a vertex to itself with a, with a boundary like this? It does, doesn't make sense, okay? So it, it wants to use at least one edge going from X to Y and use up you know, D as a distance, so as long as D is less than, now this less than is important, we cannot have less than or equal to. It has to be less than because L is an upper bound, but it's an exclusive upper bound. In other words, it cannot be L. It can be anything less than L. So D has to be less than L. And in that case, I would go like, okay, we just found a path from X to Y with a length of D. And you know, that's how we reflect back. That's how we return the value of the length of the path. So the first um, path bound is going to give me a trivial path where the two vertices are connected by one single edge. The second one is recursive. In other words, if the first one fails, in other words, I cannot get from X to Y using a single edge and having that edge to have a distance less than L, it's going to fail the first one, then will fall onto the second one. So the second one is the recursive one, which is basically saying, Okay, we need L to be at least zero, because if L is less than zero, then I really have no place to go. No place to go. Now this really should be greater than and not greater than or equal to zero, because if it if it's zero, we are guaranteed to fail, because we know this the edge the distance of an edge cannot be negative. So this really should be greater than and not greater than or equal to, but it would just fail later, you know, which is okay. It's not wrong. It's just inefficient. So it goes through the same thing, it finds an edge, but this time it's not finding an edge from X to Y, it's finding an intermediate vertex Z with a length with a distance of N1. So this is resembling the little bit of boundary that we saw earlier. And then they figure out, okay, so since we have used up N1 of the allowance already, so the new allowance is gonna be L1, which is L minus N1, because I have used up N1 from the original allowance of L. Is that okay? And now it goes recursively. It says, okay, now that our new upper bound is L1, see if you can find a path from Z to Y, or walk, I should say. Let's see if we can find a walk from Z to Y with an exclusive upper bound of L1 and report back the actual length of that path as N2. So this predicate on line 36, will fail if it, it, if it cannot find a path like that, find, cannot find a walk like that. So by the time we get to line 37, it means that we have found a walk that satisfied the boundary of L1, that, and that particular walk is going to go from Z to Y, and the actual length of that walk is N2. So by the time we get to line 37, it means all of the previous lines have been quote unquote true. So at that point I can say, oh, okay. So that means I have just found myself a walk from X to Y 
but the length of that walk is going to be n1 plus n2. n1 being the edge from x to z, n2 is the length of the walk from z to y. Are we going to, are we, yeah? It really should be path. Yeah, both of these should be named uh, walk and not path anymore because we don't have the restriction. We don't have the ability to find out whether we are repeating a vertex. So both of these should be walks. I mean, the name should be changed. <clears throat> so let me change all of those you know, just, so, just so that it's consistent, right? So I don't re use a term that is not correct. So are we... So why is it walk? Hmm? It is not a path, it is a walk, because the same vertex can be visited again. Okay, let me, let me go back to the picture, because you know, that will show you. So if I have a walk from B0 to V2, back to V0, then B5, then to B4, it is not a path anymore, because the vertexes V0 and V2, uh, I should say V0, appear twice. Okay, let me, let me just kind of write that out here. So V0 to V2, back to V0, to V5, to V4 is a walk, but not a path. Because in the path, you cannot repeat a vertex. So in the code, you mean uh, walk bound? So, hmm? okay, let's try that, right? So we'll go ahead and try this out, okay? So we say walk bound. We want to go from V0 to V4. Uh, okay, just use the wrong name here. Walk bound, there we go. So we are asking, um, given the length of zero, okay, an upper bound length of zero, can I find a path, a walk, sorry, can we find a walk from V0 to V4? And according to the picture that you saw here, not possible, right? Because the shortest your walk is this one here, it still has a length of three. So if the allowance is zero, that's, it, it cannot find that. So let's try out you know, this one, control enter. It simply says false, which means I cannot find the solution, right? So we can now change the um, allowance a little bit up, okay? Let's bump it up to three. It should still fail because the three is setting up an exclusive upper bound, which means we cannot get to three. We can, we can get close to three, but it still has to be less than three. So in this case, there is no walk that you can come up with that has a length of three that can get you, that, that is less than three that will get you from V0 to V4. Okay, show the picture again. This is V0. The shortest one is going through V3 to V4. That would still be using three. But that three here is an exclusive upper bound, which means we cannot be three. It can be anything less than three. So that means control enter. This is still returning a false. Okay, took a little bit of time, but it turns to be false. So the closest one we can do, like 3.1, should be fine, right? Because we found a path, a walk that has a, exactly a length of three. So this one would tell me, yep, found one solution. But the next one is going to be false because we cannot find any other solution that has a walk that has a length that is less than 3.1. Are we good so far? <clears throat> okay, let's try some more thing, okay? So let's try this to be 6.1. So if this is 6.1, then we would have found a few ways to get there, okay? Um, and it would, it would have repeating numbers, and I'll explain the repeating numbers too. So the first one is six, okay? The second one is five, and then it will find a three, and then it will find five again. <laughs> and that's it. Why does it find three, five again? If you look at the graph, the first one it found is this one. This is a walk from V0 to V5 to V4. That's the six. <coughs> the second one is from V0 to V1 to V4. That's the first five. Then find V0 to V3 to V4, that's the, th that's the 3. But the upper bound is a 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 6.1, 
So the next one is, is, is finding is V0 to V2, back to V0, go to V3, go to V4. That is the second five. It found all the walks <coughs> that has a length that is less than 6.1 in this case. Is that okay? All right, so getting back to the code here, we have basically now two mechanisms. Find boundary is basically increasing the number of hops until we find a path. <coughs> Walk bound is using the length itself as an allowance, as a bound, and find, the, you know, find all the solutions. So the shortest path predicate <coughs> is basically using those two. It's using find boundary first to basically say, okay, starting with zero hops, go find me a, a, a walk from X to Y and tell me what is the length of that walk, okay? It can be any walk, doesn't have to be the shortest one, okay? And then we have, this, this is a negation, this is a not, okay? It's basically saying, but not this. In other words, we take this length here and then we set up this length to be the upper bound of the length of the path from X to Y. In other words, we are basically saying, line 40 is saying, give me a walk, okay? Any number of hops is fine. Give me a walk from X to Y and tell me what is the length of that walk, okay? That may not be optimal, it's okay. Line 41 is now saying, but let's make sure that we cannot find a path that, is, that has a length that is less than n. Because when walk bound returns true, it means we found a walk that is shorter than n. So if, you, if we find anything shorter, then we have to go back to find boundary and go, go, give me another walk, okay? And based on that walk, it comes back here. If we find a shorter walk than that, it goes back. So it will basically ping pong <laughs> between line 40 and 41 until such time that line 41 says, okay, fine, you got me this time. I cannot find a path that is, that I cannot find a walk that has a length that is shorter than n, so it's gonna fail. When walk bound fails on line 41, the negation of that is gonna be successful. That is when we find the shortest, the shortest walk, which is also guaranteed to be the shortest path because by repeating a vertex, it can never be the shortest, <clears throat> the shortest walk. Yep. Yeah, because I don't care. I don't need to give it a name. Now, if you want to give it a name, M, that's fine too, <clears throat> but it's not used anywhere. So, aha, okay. The exclamation point is a very special thing. This is called the cut operator. So without the cut operator, without this one, then prolog would do its natural tendency, which is going like, I just found a shortest path. Let me see if there are other shortest paths with exactly the same length as the one that I found. Okay, but it's gonna be the same number. I don't care. I just need to find the length of one of the shortest paths. If there are multiple paths with exactly the same length and they're all quote unquote the shortest, I don't care how many paths there are. I just need the length of one of them. So that's why we have a cut operator here to basically go like, don't do the thing to find everything possible because we are good now. So that's the cut operator. Without the cut operator, the program will still work. It's just that it's going to take a lot longer to come to the conclusion because it will basically give you the same answer, the N, it will give you the same number multiple times if there are indeed multiple shortest paths. But that's not, that's not necessary because that's not the point of this algorithm. So the cut operator is not, <clears throat> you can leave it out, okay? The algorithm will simply go back and look for alternative shortest paths, which is not wrong, it's just unnecessary in this case. All right, so we want to watch this work at least once. I know we are a little bit over time. And trust me, the district will not charge you extra money for all these extra time. <laughs> okay, shortest path. V0 to V4, and we'll give it N here, which is representing the length of the path. So control enter, it will do its computation, 
and it just gives you a single answer of three, which basically means the length of the shortest walk, which is also, also the shortest path here, is three. But it doesn't give you the path itself. It can only track the length of that path. Now, earlier I said this has to be a path. I lied because you can make it a walk too. All you have to do is to go do this part here. If you make this zero and this also zero, then it can go through that loop as many times as it wants to, and it won't change the length of that walk. So then you can have multiple walks that are still considered the shortest walk in this case, and they are not paths anymore because you can ping pong between V2 and V0 as many times as you want to without changing the length of the path. But typically in a realistic graph, that does not happen. So typically they are non-zero values. All right. So aren't you guys glad that I did not turn this into a homework assignment? <laughs> but are we getting a general understanding of why Prolog is an interesting programming language? Okay, because it automatically goes like, oh, if this doesn't work, let me try something else. Because the only job of Prolog is to satisfy the predicate. And it will do its own internal mechanism to explore as many ways in order to prove that we can make this predicate true. And it, it's only when they have exhausted every single way, they will come back with an answer called like, ah, okay, I cannot get you a solution. So that's why it is an interesting programming language. You know, logic is completely built into the language itself. So is the mechanism of backtracking. Uh, did you guys talk about backtracking in uh, 430? Okay, did you guys talk about trees? Yeah. Okay, so when you have a tree and you get to a leaf node and then when you go back up, that's backtracking. Yeah, so backtracking is almost built into most algorithms that have to do with a traversal of a tree. All right, but it's built into Prolog. Okay, we are over time, so I'm gonna let you guys go. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. And then next week, I'll give you guys, I can give you the practice test early too, I mean, so you guys have a chance to work on those. So we'll do that on Wednesday, maybe. <clears throat> All right, have a nice day. See you guys on Wednesday. And I can share this code too, if anyone is interested. Yep, give me a second to pause, stop the video.